So last time we watched the 1998 Godzilla, the first American reboot. This time we're talking about the first Japanese reboot, The Return of Godzilla from 1984, which was released in Japan just as Godzilla. It ignores all the sequels to the original and goes back to the dark and serious tone that the original had and kind of tries to get as far away as it can from the goofy, flashy special effects movies that were coming out in the later 60s and 70s. It's played as a direct sequel to the original movie. And it's very ambiguous as to how closely it ties into the original movie, considering Godzilla definitively died at the end of the original. And they don't make it clear in this one whether it's the same Godzilla or a different Godzilla or how he survived or anything like that. They kind of don't even talk about it. It's just, it's Godzilla and he's here. So it starts off just like the 19. 19- 98 American one because there's a boat full of Japanese people and gets attacked. I liked in this one how long they took to show Godzilla, how they purposefully really worked hard to keep it ambiguous. And there was some point I was even wondering, is it going to turn out to be Godzilla or something else? Yeah, that's interesting because you have a, a fresher perspective than I do. And my memories are all of all the monsters always showing up all the time. So maybe it was a case of mistaken identity or something. It was really good. Yeah, this one takes a... I think out of all the Godzilla movies, this one has the most horror tone to it, including in the music and the way way it's shot, and especially with the opening, with the reporter finding the boat that gets attacked and himself getting attacked by the giant sea lice that have grown gigantic because they've fed on Godzilla and been affected by the radiation. Some of that scene when he finds the corpses reminds me a lot of The Thing. I feel like that's directly what they were going off of. This is two years after that came out. The big difference here is that the corpses in those scenes look really bad. When it had the shadow of the first guy, even the shadow looked super fake. And I was thinking to myself, oh man, that better be a CPR dummy or something. But it was a guy. Yeah. My favorite is the hand that drops into frame. And some of the lighting in that scene randomly goes into the the colorful greens and, and weird colors that you get in something like Creep Show or like old Mario Bava movies. It, it turns into horror lighting all of a sudden. It's like, what what's causing that? The effects in the scene with the giant sea louse. Yeah, they're pretty good. They're, yeah, they're excellent. The way it flies around, I, I don't even know how that's supposed to happen. And it's so stiff, and even the sound effects are kind of weird. It's a, it's a very awkward scene. It reminded me of the cat in Reanimator. But that's played for laughs on purpose. (laughs) So then Okamura is telling everybody what he saw. He says, I saw a giant monster. He says that it was too big to even be able to see it clearly. And then Hayashida comes into the hospital and he shows him pictures of Godzilla. Because he believes that that's what it really was. The prime minister says, I was hoping to finish my term without any incident. But it's not, <laughs> yeah. it's not like the stock market dipped. It's not like there's some domestic strife. It's Godzilla. And he's like, oh man, I was hoping to get through my term. <laughs> it's a gigantic monster that could wipe out your entire country. And you're treating it like Pizza Hut's out of pepperoni or something. In this movie, it's clear that he's just making a little joke, like a little throwaway joke. But in an American movie, that would have been something where the audience was supposed to laugh out loud. Oh, I get it. I I understand what this guy's going through. That kind of thing. And a really bad, cringy thing for actually intelligent people. Yeah. You call this coffee? I call this America. I like how everybody in the know is on the honor system. So the military and the top brass know about Godzilla and they're willing to talk about it to other people, but it's, we'll tell you about it, but don't talk about it to anybody else. And then they even let Maki take pictures. They say, you can take pictures of these survivors, but don't publish them yet. Whereas I think of today where people will publish things, even if they're not true, just for clicks or just for ratings. I wonder how much of that is a difference between Japan and the U.S. And how much of it is a timing thing. I'd imagine in a U.S. movie, they would keep people kind of locked up and not even let them talk to anybody else if they wanted to keep it secret. Something like that. Right. But once Maki gets in and takes pictures... They say, well, okay, you're already in here, but don't publish them yet. They don't want anyone to say anything because then the whole country would be in a panic if word got out. So Professor Hayashida is working on genetic combinations. And specifically because his parents were killed by Godzilla. Does his genetic combination thing ever really come up again? I mean, it ties into the next movie, but not so much this one. That's true. I thought it was going to be somehow related to how they would defeat Godzilla in this one, but it doesn't really come up. That's a good point. I would say he's at least studying mutations, genetic mutations. It's at least tied together in, 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 a, in a loose way. Yeah. When Maki goes to Hayashida's lab, there's that weird pipe thing on the wall with all the valves. 
What is the purpose of that? If you need pipes, then get pipes. There are probably 80, 90 degree angles in that thing, and it's just going from floor to ceiling. Yeah, I wonder what that is for. I wonder if they specifically put that in there just because it looked complicated and scientific. Yeah, but it doesn't. Or if it was actually there and served some kind of purpose. <laughs> what purpose could that possibly serve? I don't know. I don't know. Aesthetics. It's Japan. They think about aesthetics. They can't. It's not just put a pipe going down the wall. Let's make it look cool. When Hayashida is explaining... Tamaki about Godzilla, he picks up this book in his high-tech laboratory, and it's a children's picture book of dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, I think I own that book, or at least a book with the same cover image. That's the most high-tech dinosaur book he could find, and he doesn't have any kids, so he can't say it's my son's. That's something that's common even in some of the older Godzilla movies, is pulling up kids' books and, and pointing at dinosaur pictures and saying, this is what we're dealing with. I do want to point out one of the models that he has in his office is a some kind of bipedal creature with a large crocodile head. That's not a real animal. I don't know what that's supposed to be. There's no way a bipedal animal would have a head that big. So then we're introduced to Naoko, who is Okamura's younger sister. So we have our four main characters. We got the reporter, we got the survivor, we got the scientist, and we got the female interest, which is fine. That's all we need. That's good. And they all do a good job. That's true. I would say the prime minister is also a, a pretty big character. Yeah, yeah. I would agree. In an American movie, the female character would clearly be being set up specifically as a love interest right from the beginning. You know that that's going to be there if it's an American movie. And it's you kind of get hints of that maybe in this movie, but it never. there are more important things to deal with in this movie. So the Japanese government is so bent on keeping Godzilla secret, they haven't even told Naoko that Okamura is still alive. So Maki spills the beans and she does the running thing, you know, where she's running at a weird pace and she has that smile on her face. Yeah, it's a very Japanese thing, I feel like. Yeah, it would have fit in an anime. Speaking of anime, Naoko looks like a live action anime character. She has a perfectly round head. She's got gigantic eyes. She's got that anime haircut and she's Japanese. I've never seen anybody else that looks so much like an anime character like that in real life. Godzilla destroys a Soviet sub, a nuclear sub, that leads to accusations that maybe America was responsible. And in order to avoid any kind of international conflict that could lead to a nuclear war, Japan decides to release their information and say, Godzilla, we know Godzilla is here. We know he was responsible. Which is good. Yeah, again, it makes sense. It's not a, a, a dumb, let's build up tension movie thing. It feels logical. Right. I thought it was interesting that the government eventually comes clean. I would have thought there would be at least one character in the government who wants to protect state secrets at the expense of the citizens and is fighting the whole time to do that and would become kind of a human antagonist. But mm. they didn't do that, which was nice. It would have been too cliche. Yeah. Again, that's something that you would have gotten in an, in an American movie. My expectations were met and it went even higher. And at this point, we still have not seen Godzilla at all, which is awesome. And then the question becomes on everyone's mind, when will he attack? Because it's inevitable. I really like the pacing of this movie. I like how logical it felt. The sequence of events felt like they would have actually happened that way. Right. It doesn't feel like a movie just being a movie. It feels more real than that. This is the first movie that introduces the idea of Godzilla consuming nuclear energy, consuming radiation, and, and gaining his power from that. And that's why they think he's going to attack Japan, because of the nuclear reactors. There was a little bit of the Showa series brought back in this one when they're at the military conference and they talk about the Super X, which is basically a flying fortress. That felt like an earlier Godzilla thing. It felt out of place in this movie. The only reason they have it is because they're going to shoot the cadmium shells, which can control nuclear reactions within atomic reactors. So they say, logically, it should work against Godzilla since he's basically a walking nuclear reactor. But they didn't need the Super X to do that. They could have just shot it from any tank. That's true, but I do like the fact that they've already been attacked by Godzilla in the past. They know something like that is possible. At least they have something in mind that they can use in case something happens again, even if right. it's not necessarily the most practical design. The cadmium controlling nuclear reactions sounded plausible to me. I don't know anything about that, but it sounded like it's something that could be true. Looking up cadmium's usage in nuclear reactors, I'm skeptical that it would work the way they use it, but they seem pretty confident about it, and I'm not a scientist. Either way, it's a cool idea. So the entire country is preparing itself for a Godzilla attack, and I like that. 
Because again, people are making logical steps and they're saying, he's going to attack. We don't want to be unprepared. So we're going to do what we have to do. The first time I was a little disappointed is when Godzilla sneaks up on the first guy and the guy doesn't notice him until he turns around and then we see him as a viewer. That was annoying. I agree. I think that's, it's really lame, really disappointing. And for being the big reveal, it could have been a lot better. Mm -hmm. And then even after that, when they, when the authorities say, how come we didn't know Godzilla was there? And their answer was just, it was really foggy. We didn't see him. The fog. Yeah, the fog. Everyone was so busy watching that John Carpenter movie, they didn't pay attention to Godzilla showing up. It was the fog. When the guard sees Godzilla, Godzilla walks toward the camera and just kind of walks over the camera, and you never hear the guard make a sound. Did he get stepped on and just not say anything? It's It feels a little bit like it's missing something there. So he shows up to the nuclear plant, and we get the first look at him. I really, really like the camera work at this point. They purposely make him not fit in the frame a lot, just for different body parts like his head or his foot or this upper body. I really liked that because it just shows how big he actually is. Right. They definitely put a little bit more work into that in this movie than they would do even in some of the subsequent ones. But they only did it for this scene, which I was disappointed with. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say only this scene, but but they definitely do it more in this scene than they do later. Yeah. I really like the shot that starts out behind his head and kind of pulls over as, as his face comes into view. For not having seen Godzilla up to this point in his entirety, it's a great reveal. And they waited an appropriate amount of time, I think, to do it. Would you agree? Yeah, in general, I, th I think it's a good scene. I don't like the specific shot that pans up to Godzilla, because Godzilla, it's, his eyes ruin everything for me. Because it looks like he's just kind of looking off into the distance all the time, and they feel lifeless. I also really like the way Godzilla's lips, kind of the way he snarls. Mm -hmm. That's animatronics in there. I assume the original costume just had something less sophisticated yeah i know the guy who designed the godzilla stuff in this movie thought a lot about how the jaws would work one problem i do have with the godzilla designs in here including the mouth is the way the robot godzilla looks completely different from the suit especially the face it doesn't look like the same monster at all and his head the shape of it is really strange from certain angles especially when you see it from the side it reminds me kind of of the aliens from the invaders from mars remake mr potato head looking kind of ones but the teeth remind me a lot of it he's got very sharp teeth in this movie when godzilla attacks the reactor you see the people inside running around and trying to get everything shut off i guess before godzilla shows up and there's slow motion shots of guys falling off catwalks which i find really funny and i really like the shot of godzilla grabbing the reactor and his spikes lighting up as he's absorbing the radiation that it looks really cool so godzilla attacks the reactor but then he's drawn away by a bunch of the dumbest cartoon birds ah they could yeah. they couldn't have thought of any better way to do that somebody had to animate those and somehow that was easier than getting footage of real birds and just compositing them into this or scene. just or doing quick cuts of birds flying by and then going to his head and him turning his head i don't know anything anything other than that yeah i think that's maybe the single worst effect in this movie yeah it's a top contender for sure but it is a plot point because Aishida says Godzilla has a magnetic area homing signal and the birds going by somehow affected that so he's got to try and figure out what they actually did that's part of his plan to get Godzilla away so Hayashida wants to use synthetic sound waves to lure Godzilla to Mount Mihara and he's going to make it erupt that's his plan even though sound waves have nothing to do with magnetism uh the science doesn't really make a lot of sense as usual for these movies but at least they're trying with something there and they're going into the what at the time were relatively new theories of dinosaurs being related to birds. When Hayashida is working on his stuff, they go to his lab and he's working on his synthetic sound waves and he has headphones on, but the sound in the room is so loud that everyone else is covering their ears, but he's wearing headphones. You wear headphones so the sound's in your headphones. <laughs> Maybe he's using it to block out the sound. <laughs> I don't okay. know. Yeah, that's a good point. So they have this conference between the U.S., the Soviets, and Japan. The U.S. ambassador is a terrible actor. <laughs> they couldn't find anyone better? Yeah, he's not great. I like how stereotypical everybody is in this scene. My favorite, just two words. Is, he, is it when he says, he's right? Yes! <laughs> yeah, that's that's my favorite part. Господин премьер-министр, не применив тактического ядерного оружия, мы не видим другого способа уничтожить Годзиллу. We ask your He's right! At that point, I was thinking, God, this guy is a terrible actor. And then he went, 
He's right. And I was like, yeah, I know I'm right. <laughs> I like the shots there from the side of the prime minister's head as he's listening to the American and Soviet oh, yeah. ambassadors. It's just another example of how more well thought out a lot of the cinematography is in this movie. It's it's a scene that's very on on paper is very plain and bland, and they made it really interesting visually as well as content wise. I'll tell you what, one of my favorite parts of that scene was how the prime minister doesn't say anything. Yes. So the U.S. and the Soviets want to use nuclear weapons. There's hell bent on using nuclear weapons. And Japan, of course, is the only country that's had nuclear weapons used on its soil, and they're not exactly happy about the idea. So the prime minister goes into a cabinet meeting, and they carry over, again, prime minister saying almost nothing, and that whole circle of people throwing out different viewpoints. Again, it's a scene that on paper might look boring, but it was one of the most engaging scenes of this entire movie, to hear all these different viewpoints being thrown out at each other, and the pros and cons of each one, and the prime minister sitting there just taking it all in, not saying anything. I agree. I think this is maybe maybe the best scene in the whole movie. It's the most thoughtful and, and realistic and engaging scene. With all these people that we haven't even, most of them have not said anything in this movie, but you, you get a strong sense for who a lot of these people are, you know, what their stance is, why they're saying what they're saying. And a lot of them are have conflicting points that both make sense in their own way. Nobody's a caricature or, you know, over the top saying stupid, ridiculous things. Like in an American movie, you would get characters that were blatantly stupid just shouting out things saying we need to just destroy everything or no we need to protect it because it's scientifically important it would be all the cliche generic stock character ideas we have a strong reason to believe it may be hiding inside one of the buildings within the restricted area but you don't know for sure mr mayor but in this movie everybody feels like a real person with real ideas about how to handle the situation so as an example you'll have one guy say maybe we should use nuclear weapons and then another guy says it would result in less casualties than Godzilla. And then another guy says, yeah, but what about the radiation afterwards? And then another guy says, will nuclear weapons even work? And just those kinds of things, just those conversations make this scene so good because they're asking legitimate questions. You feel as a viewer that they're really trying to come to a conclusion of what they want to do. What are the pros and cons of taking each action or inaction? Right. I really appreciate that there's more to this movie than just let's show a monster destroying a city. And then saying, let's go destroy that monster at any cost. It's, it's a lot more uh, thoughtful than that. So the prime minister decides against the use of nuclear weapons because he's afraid that that would lead other countries to be more willing to use nuclear weapons in the future. His speech was very eloquent. And it felt very realistic, even the way he talks about talking to the leaders of the U.S. and Russia about his thought process on it. And of course, the American guy is very American when he says, This is no time to be discussing principles. <laughs> like, he's just going to throw all that out the window because, <laughs> damn it, he's an American. And our principles only matter when they matter. I like the shot. The American guy puts his head down in disappointment. And I really like the shot when they cut over to the Soviets. And the one guy just kind of looks over and does a shrug. So Godzilla's heading for Tokyo Bay. And the JSDF is going... Full defense mode, while Hayashida is still trying to figure out his pattern of synthetic sound waves. So Godzilla does a full-scale attack on Tokyo Bay, and everyone's ready, and they just launch everything at him. The Russian boat that's in the in the area that Godzilla's attacking is the boat that has the controls for the space satellite that has the nuclear missile on it that they agreed not to use, and they deactivate the controls, but when Godzilla attacks... The damage to the ship causes the warhead to inadvertently be launched. There's one Russian guy who gets injured, and he's crawling over to the panel, and he's going to try to shut it off, and he dies right before he can get there, so the missile does get launched. And in the American version, given that it was the mid-80s, the Russian guy is injured, and he's crawling over to the panel to purposely launch the missile. It's the exact opposite of what's happening in the Japanese version, which makes me wonder what people who understood Russian were thinking when they were watching the movie, and the guy's saying, I have to stop that missile, and then he goes over and launches the missile. And then one of my favorite scenes in this whole movie, Godzilla uses his atomic breath and he wipes out everything pretty much all at the same time. And then there's just total silence.
because they've been shooting for such an extended period of time and there's so much noise, there's so much static, there's so much going on. And this movie uses sound in such a brilliant way. The way they do that makes the scene feel so much more impactful. It feels like a lot more than what you got in a lot of the older movies where it was just model tanks and jets shooting tracer rounds at him or whatever. This actually feels like something that's going on and feels like something that matters. The fact that he just wiped everybody out so quickly and easily. There are two shots in the scene that I really like. The scene where they're all shooting at Godzilla. After they kind of expend everything, there's a real quick zoom in on Godzilla's eye. And he just looks really angry. And there's a shot from the boat where you see missiles flying at Godzilla and the people are on the boat. And you can tell that they're not really there, but it looks really cool anyway. I don't like the sound effects for all the explosions. It's like they only have so many tracks to work with and sound effects are cutting other sound effects off. And they don't sound like real explosions. They feel kind of old-fashioned. They feel like they would have fit in the 70s movies. I feel like that undercuts the scene a little bit, but I still think it's really effective overall. And especially the visual of after Godzilla has nuked everything, it looks really good. Speaking of the 70s movies, the dumb guy in the restaurant, is there some significance like he's a comedian? He was a singer. I would guess that's why he's in the movie, is because people knew who he was. But that is definitely something that doesn't fit in with the rest of the movie, that breaks the tone, that breaks the flow. Completely. He had no purpose in the movie at all. It made me actively angry. Agreed. And those scenes go on for a while. And he's talking to himself and he's making jokes and he's just being stupid. And for a movie that is so focused on characters and how impactful they are and how much they matter. And then you throw this guy in for no reason at all. Ugh. Yeah, it definitely felt like more of an American thing where they would have handled it sort of as a comic relief kind of thing. Thankfully, it's not as bad as that probably would have been, but it still ruins all the... Th those scenes are those scenes are off. I really like the bullet train sequence. Oh, yeah. That's a very... It puts everything in perspective, and it makes, it makes it feel like there's more happening than just Godzilla wrecking a model city. There's people there. Those people are in danger. They're reacting to it, even though the one guy does a weird smile. I think he's probably a, a well-known actor or somebody. Okay, but see, it's... At at that point, one, two seconds max, whereas the restaurant guy had scenes dedicated just to him. Right. He was he was an actual character for some reason. I especially like the end because, again, an American movie, you would expect them to be okay for something to happen where they would be safe. But at the end, he just drops that car and all those people die. That's it. Right. You don't see people driving out of Godzilla's mouth onto a bridge. <sighs> or you don't see the Super X showing up and shooting him and... Catching people as they fall. Yeah. The fact that Godzilla treats it so inconsequentially really shows his character type and really accentuates what kind of character Godzilla is. He doesn't care. Why would he care? It doesn't matter to him. Right. I really like the shots in that scene where you see Godzilla's reflection in the windows. Again, yeah. it's something that you wouldn't normally think about, but it makes the movie feel more more real. So again, we have multiple plans to stop Godzilla. And I like how they're enacting all their plans separately at the same time because they don't know which one's going to work. So Haishida, his signal works. So he's trying to get to the roof to get a helicopter to go to the volcano. But at the same time, the military has thrown the Super X at Godzilla, and it engages him, and it uses its cadmium rounds, and that works too. Again, it's more realistic in that there's not just the one plan that's going to work. Right. I do want to mention that the way they find out that Hayashida's plan is working, that the sound is affecting Godzilla, is they try it out on Godzilla to see if he'll react. When they're 10 feet away from him. Yeah, that's not exactly the smartest option there. Yeah, well, you know, his reading level hasn't gone past giant dinosaur picture books, so I'm not that surprised. The building gets damaged. All of our main characters, other than the Prime Minister, end up being trapped in the top of this large building. Because the automatic locks engage on all the doors for some reason. I, I didn't really understand that. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense, but could assume that it's not working the way it's supposed to. Or maybe it's like a safety thing, like elevators stop working if there's a fire in a building. But I don't understand why all the doors would lock and trap everybody inside. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense. The U.S. talks about launching a counter missile to intercept the Soviet one. They don't know for sure if it'll get there in time. They don't know for sure at, at first if the cadmium missiles are going to work, but they do end up knocking Godzilla out. So Okamura goes to get the rest of the party out of the building with a helicopter, but there's a lot of turbulence. So Maki and Naoko get left behind. I had to smile at the shot of the little miniature building and the tiny screen in the window of them Oh, leaving. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it was pretty funny. But I like how Naoko, she talks about what's going on. Hayashida-sensei was okay, but the 
私たちきっとここで死んじゃうんだわ。I like her kind of realistic, fatalistic view of what's going on.、Mm -hmm. I also like the way they knock Godzilla out and he's surrounded by a crowd of people and the police are there trying to hold him back. But these people are like walking right up to him. There's a huge crowd and this area is supposed to have been evacuated and there's still so many people walking around everywhere. So the missile intercept is good, but it causes an electromagnetic storm because of the radiation, which wakes Godzilla back up and also disables the Super X. I like the shots of Godzilla waking up. It's a very horror movie kind of thing where you know that the villain is coming back, whatever the monster, evil monster is, in this case, Godzilla. And again, the visuals with the red sky, everything looks really interesting and really cool. It makes for a, a very different feel than you normally get out of Godzilla movies. So then all of the dumb people start saying, We should get out of here, and they all start running away. But you know what? They deserve to get stepped on. They're all idiots. We get a lot of shots of people running around and Godzilla's foot coming down in the background, which is the life size foot that they built and swung from a crane. It's obvious that they were worried about damaging it because it comes down so slowly. It doesn't match at all the way Godzilla's walking. And there are way too many shots of it, most of which were cut out of the American version. It's cool that they built the giant foot, but they should have just dropped it, maybe just used it for a couple shots if it gets damaged. It doesn't look great when you see it coming down so slowly. It really takes away from everything that's going on and is too distracting. I like the way Godzilla took out the Super X because he didn't just knock it down. It was almost、uh, rubbing salt in the wound of, yeah, you're down, but I'm going to drop a building on you just because you're really annoying, you know? Yeah, and I like the shot of Godzilla standing over the building. You've just seen Godzilla destroy the only thing that's managed to even slow him down so far, and it's almost like he doesn't even care. It's just that's over with. So Haishida reaches the volcano and he gets his signal to work, so Godzilla's lured away. We're really close to the end of the movie. I think there's five minutes left. And it doesn't feel like a typical movie where you kind of know that this is the end. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, the pacing, the writing, everything about this movie is so well done, except for the dumb restaurant guy. Yeah, it does a really good job of keeping the main characters in danger in some kind of way, at least some of the main characters. And they're characters that you actually care about. And again, an American movie would make sure all the main characters are there for all the main events. But we've just seen that Maki and Naoko got left behind. They couldn't go with Okamura and Haishida, which is something that would probably happen. Not to mention, none of the Super X characters even have names. We don't know who they are, but the Super X plays an important part in the story. Right. Whereas if it were an American movie like Pacific Rim, it'd be like, Rodley! Rodley! You're in the Pacific <laughs> Rim robot! Rodley. Yeah. Rodley! This is my dog! I also call him Rodley! <laughs> So then Godzilla gets to the volcano, he stands on the edge, starts to fall in. They set off all these explosives around the rim, and he falls in. Nobody cheers. There's no great celebrations going on. It's a little deeper than just saying, Yeah, we got him. Mission accomplished. Happy music and roll credits. Right. It's very somber. Right. So the Prime Minister's standing front and center, and his cabinet is in a semicircle behind him. It's a really good shot. There's one shot that zooms past Godzilla, and Godzilla's not moving at all, and I think it's just a, a model Godzilla, and it, it doesn't look great. Thankfully, it's very short. But I really do like the shot of him actually falling in, the way you see his shadow. So in the Japanese version, he does kind of a standard Godzilla roar as he falls in. But in the American version, he lets out this really weird long scream. Which was something that Toho actually created themselves for international releases. For whatever reason, it doesn't sound like Godzilla, but at the same time, it, it fits the scene. And the music in the scene, I think, is great too. That scream is the same scream they used in the Blu ray version of Return of the Jedi when they throw Palpatine <laughs> into that energy chamber. <laughs> At one point, Haishida says he goes into internal monologue mode and he talks about how the world has become unbalanced and nature is basically reasserting itself through natural disasters. And humans are the real monsters. Right. And then I thought that kind of tied in at the end, too, because everything a man could do was not enough to beat Godzilla. So they had to resort to using nature itself to defeat Godzilla. They handled Godzilla as a force and not just we have to, we have to kill this giant thing. Right. Godzilla himself, they treat Godzilla as a natural disaster. Hayashida himself is given more depth than you would normally expect for a character whose parents were killed by Godzilla and who's working on ways to. 
stop Godzilla. He's not angry. He doesn't seem to particularly want to kill Godzilla. He respects Godzilla. And after Godzilla falls, it even shows him he's not happy about it. Right. I don't think anybody's happy at the end of this movie. They're glad that they've survived. The prime minister is crying. The whole tone of the movie is very somber. It's a very sad situation, no matter what angle you look at it from. For Godzilla and for the people involved, it's something that nobody wants to happen. Nobody's going to come out and be the victor, really. It's just kind of, we managed to survive. There was a small theme of humanity working together, the way the U.S., the Soviets, and the Japanese all sat down. And when the Soviets launched the nuclear warhead by mistake and the U.S. said, we'll help you out. And even them sitting in the conference room and the Japanese prime minister saying, we're not going to use nuclear weapons. And he gives a speech why. And the other two countries are disappointed, but they don't continue to argue with him. Which I think is funny because in the American version, they create this manufactured animosity between the Soviets and everyone else when they launch the missile on purpose. General Goodhue. We have a Russian launch condition from an orbiting satellite. But that violates the UN Space Treaty. The Soviets are those typical human villains that you expect that you don't get in the Japanese version. I thought there was going to be a conflict between using brute force to stop Godzilla and using science to stop Godzilla. But I was very happy that that didn't happen. They tried both plans pretty much simultaneously. I guess I was just expecting an American movie where... You just have people at odds with each other when really the main threat is a giant monster that's going to kill everybody. And if they had been at each other's throats, I would have said that's dumb. So I'm glad they didn't. Right. I like the way everybody's perspective in this movie makes sense for their own situation. Even if they don't necessarily agree, they all have reasons for feeling the way they do. And even though the U.S. and the Soviets do kind of have ulterior motives in that they kind of want to open the possibility of using nuclear weapons against each other, they end up seeing things from the Japanese point of view. Even though we don't actually see the leaders of those countries, we kind of know why they agreed based on what the prime minister said about them. Right. And all the characters are not just moving forward on a certain course of action because the script tells them they're supposed to. And the most heavy handed theme in this one, obviously, is nuclear weapons are not good. We should avoid using nuclear weapons. Probably not a good idea. At the same time, I thought it was it was a logical as opposed to a preachy approach. Right. Because they do they do consider it. There is a possibility that it could be an option, but they end up taking that option off the table because it's such a bad one. Right. And they think out the reasons why or why not. Whereas in an American one, you would have someone saying, Let me spell it out for you. I want you to blow up Madison Square Garden. I like the score a lot for this movie. I listen to it all the time. Yeah. It doesn't feel like a Godzilla movie, but it's really cool. It really fits the specific tone of this particular movie. Right. I think about a movie like Space Godzilla, where you hear the first three notes and you know what movie it's from. And it's just those very heavy, in your face, this is who's on the screen now. This is what's happening now. Again, don't you remember from last time, 15 seconds ago? Right, it's a lot more of a simplistic approach in right. terms of how it's actually used in the movie. So the music is not at all what I expected. I expected major themes for certain things and certain characters whenever they show up. The only time I got that was from the Super X. one of the only times I got music I expected to hear and again it felt like it was from the earlier Godzilla movies when that happened all the time. The only other expected time was when the military is getting ready and you hear the generic let's set up our guns and get ready for this attack. Which it wasn't bad but the music is more subdued in this one. It's more sparse. It's used more intelligently, just like the cinematography and the writing and the pacing are used more intelligently. Right. I would say it's it's used more specifically because a lot of the older movies just kind of play the music over the scene. Right. And this one feels like there's more specific moments. The use of sound in this movie in general is awesome. Tokyo 
the music definitely had a Jaws influence to certain parts of it in trying to get to that kind of horror theme that the movie has compared to a lot of other Godzilla movies. I didn't think of Jaws, but now that you say it, I could see that. I thought the music, the scene was there and they told the composer, I want you to match the scene. I don't want you to just do Godzilla's theme because Godzilla's here, you know? Right. In a lot of the 90s, if Fukube scored movies, he would just have a few days to write the entire score for the movie. A lot of times the recycling themes he had used in earlier movies and just changing them slightly. It was more kind of a, a timing kind of thing. It felt like more than a specific beat for beat kind of thing. As in the music had to be a certain length. Right. I also really liked that while Godzilla was attacking, no music was playing at all. The only sound you got was from the explosions the gunfire and that sort of thing again the music and then the lack of music in the right spots was very effective it was good it was really good it was way better than i expected and i expected to like it anyway yeah this is definitely one of my favorite ones i think the the more serious ones tend to be the better ones in general and this is definitely one of the most serious ones one of the most realistic ones one of the darkest ones and one that never gets boring all the human talking scenes are at least as interesting as everything else that's happening i say that conference with the japanese cabinet was the most engaging part of this movie it was great it reminded me of shin godzilla in that way yeah definitely and that's a movie that focused almost entirely on that and made it really interesting so godzilla in this one is 80 meters tall is that consistent with before that is 30 meters larger throughout the movie his size seems inconsistent some shots his foot you'll just see his foot and it is so big and then it will show full body shot and he doesn't seem as big yeah i i somewhat agree their special effects guy suggested making a full-size godzilla and i don't know if he meant it as a joke but he did suggest it and they pretty much immediately said that's not physically possible. But they did make the foot that's supposed to be life-size. They did also make a 16-foot robot Godzilla that they called the Cybot. You probably watched that King Kong movie and said, we could do something that dumb. Yeah, I was going to say they should have learned from the King Kong movie. But I do think that that was an, an influence on them. They said, you know, giant robots are possible. Let's make our own. Maybe we can do it better than they can. And they did. It doesn't look as bad as the King Kong one, at least. But it's still not that great. You can tell the shots when it's used. Yeah, and they didn't end up using it as much as they initially wanted to. And you mostly only see it from the from the waist up, or even just the head. Right. I'm not a fan of his eyeballs. Yeah, he looks almost like he's half asleep. They look like I would go to Hobby Lobby and buy, you know, a bag of googly eyes or something. <laughs> I think part of it is the contrast between his skin, having that texture, and then his eyes look so cheap. I agree. I would say the entire costume feels like it lacks detail. The eyes are definitely, they feel too clean. The irises are perfectly round. His teeth are very clean too. Yeah, it, it all feels a little too too manufactured, I guess is kind of how I would say it. I would say even the suit in the original Godzilla looks better than this one. The Return of Godzilla, one of the best Godzilla movies. The start of what should have been a more serious Godzilla series. Unfortunately, it didn't make a ton of money, so they ended up going into a more fantastical series of movies that are aimed more for younger viewers and are far less sophisticated than this one. But at least we got a really good reboot. Which is what the Showa ones turned into by the end, which is why they did this one in the first place. Right. They just went along that pattern a lot more quickly the second time around, which is unfortunate. It reminded me of James Bond, the way that series progressed, how... When Sean Connery started out, those movies were full of espionage and serious situations, and it quickly turned into the fantastical goofiness that most people associate with it. And every time they tried to go back to that seriousness, it wasn't as successful as they wanted it to be, so they just reverted back to going to the moon or having a guy with a yo-yo that's made up of giant buzz saws <laughs> or, or having Christopher Lee as a guy with three nipples who shoots a gun made out of gold and has a little person as his servant who brings him hot sauce on a tray. So the American version of The Return of Godzilla was released as Godzilla 1985, and they brought back Raymond Burr, who was in the American version of the original Godzilla. They initially intended to dub it as a comedy and make it almost like a parody of itself, and Raymond Burr said, no, if I'm going to be involved, you're going to treat it seriously. You're going to do it just as a straight Godzilla movie. And they said, well, okay. That being said, all of the American inserted scenes of people at the Pentagon are bad. The dialogue is really bad. The acting is not great. The other characters all feel like complete idiots. 
idiots, which again is kind of typical for an American movie. And of course, none of them have anything to do with anything that's actually going on. They're just kind of watching. But at least Raymond Burr, being that he handles things seriously, even his final lines at the end of the movie when Godzilla falls into the volcano, on paper they, they read as a little goofy, but he delivers them really well. It fits in with the weight of the whole situation. The reckless ambitions of man are often dwarfed by their dangerous consequences. For now, Godzilla, that strangely innocent and tragic monster, has gone to Earth. Whether he returns or not, or is never again seen by human eyes, the things he has taught us remain. they handled it somewhat respectfully. Also, there is a Dr. Pepper machine on every corner of the Pentagon. They also wanted a scene where Raymond Burr would drink Dr. Pepper. I'm sure it's an anecdotal story. The story goes, when they asked him to do it, he didn't say anything. He just stared the other guy down until he said, oh, okay, you don't have to. <laughs> I'm sure they probably wanted a cameo by Charles Barkley, too. The Super X would shoot Dr. Pepper cans at Godzilla. <laughs> Unless we find something to appease him. Oh! 